So as I say, different process, Form 10 versus Form 11. Um, an example for Form 10, uh, if a person has an animal on the scheme without permission, the contravention is current and it's not going away. Example of Form 11, a uh, person is held party every Friday night for the last month and it's likely the contravention will occur again. Give notice that the committee believe the person has contravened the by law and the contravention is likely to keep happening into the future. That form allows for a three month window. If the contravention occurs in the three months, then the body corporate can pursue the contravention without any further notice being given. Uh, another example, which uh, my info team has very helpfully provided me, an owner has parked in the visitor's car park since moving in. The car is presently there, has been in the past, and it's likely to be there again in the future. Therefore, if the person parks there again, the body corporate can pursue. Uh, unlike Form 10, once the breach has been remedied, uh, say for example, they take the car away, the body corporate can't pursue it. And then if the contravention notice is not applied, then the enforcement process begins. The Act says that enforcement is through the Magistrates Court or my office, uh, and the vast majority of those will come to my office. Gosh, we got through that fairly quickly. Um, look, I realised there was a fair bit there, and I realised I probably spoke really quickly, but as I say, it's much preferable for me to hear some feedback or some Q&A. Um, there's the contact details there. As I say, I'm sure you've got those all on speed dial, so that's all good. Um, with that, I will throw it open to some questions. Hello. Uh one about pets, uh, what if somebody moves in with a pet without approval, um, what's the process in the meantime, can we get them to take the pet out, pending proper formal application for approval? You certainly, you certainly can, um, let's, let's go back a few steps in the process because it's probably worthwhile going back a few steps. It's quite commonplace that we will get inquiries and disputes where somebody is about to settle on a property and they have a pet that they would like to bring with them and they are either they're seeking permission to have a pet. In an ideal world, they would build in a lot of time for that to occur, a lot of lead-in time for it to occur, and they will have gone through the process of seeking approval prior to settlement. That's what would happen in the ideal world, and they would approach someone from capital, they would go to the committee, the committee would consider it, everyone's happy. The reality, of course, is that when you're purchasing a property uh, and you're, you know, you've you got all of the hectic goings on with settlement, uh, thinking about that is sometimes the last thing that a lot of people will think about, particularly if the real estate agent has made a very unhelpful comment that this is a pet-friendly complex and you'll be fine, don't worry about it, all of that sort of stuff. It, it happens that people come to my office and settlement is in a few days' time and, oh, what can I do about the pet? They said I can't have a pet, they said it needs approval, and we've left it a little late in the process. So the committee can follow the contravention process if the bylaw is, as a general rule of thumb, if the bylaw is not being followed, and in this case it would be that that pet is not approved, then they can follow the bylaw enforcement process. I, I guess the more pragmatic approach there is that if you, in the situation where a new owner or occupier has moved in with a pet, that's unapproved, the first step would always be to communicate, discuss with them. Look, did you, were you actually aware that we have a bylaw that says X, Y, Z? In some cases, they might not actually be aware, and, and I, you know, have, have a bit of leeway in this situation, whilst technically everybody should know what bylaws are before they move in, or on moving in, the reality is, again, that's probably one of the last things that they're aware of. So have the discussion, they might actually go, oh, I didn't know that, all right, well, we'll do this properly from this point then. If it's not, if they're not amenable to that, or, or they're not listening, or whatever the case may be, it's a process of bylaw enforcement from that point, that preliminary process that I described earlier, and then ultimately, if required, to my office. That does not stop that person coming to my office at the same time and seeking approval through that forum as well. Yeah. So the, the two processes can actually, and it has happened that my office has had two, two applications, same scheme, same person, different approaches, one from body corporate, one from the owner. Bye. Very briefly, can you give us an overview of what the bylaw enforcement process costs 
Uh, Chris, is that an expensive path to go down? So in my office, uh, and probably, probably it's a good problem to talk about dispute resolution more generally because I realise I haven't actually done that. So my office uh, has a responsibility to provide dispute resolution for body corporate matters and we have what's called an exclusive jurisdiction. So with the exception of a limited number of contractual disputes and those contractual disputes typically go off to QCAT. Uh, my office will handle pretty much every dispute about the body corporate matter. We have both departmental conciliation and departmental adjudication. Conciliation is, as the name suggests, a bit different to if anyone's ever undergone, say, a mediation process, like a court-ordered mediation process or something along those lines. It's not quite the same. Uh, our conciliators guide the process and give information in the process. I, as I say, I've sat in on some of those conciliations and I've heard people express surprise about, oh, I didn't realise that. It, it, you, I didn't realise it would be like this. Our conciliators will actually tell people, no, what you're doing there is not right. You are not actually uh, following the legislation. That can be uh, a little bit confronting for people who have this idea that mediation will be this straight, up and down, impartial approach. No, it won't be. Our conciliators will have a responsibility to do that. Um, conciliation will be the first step in the vast majority of circumstances. In some cases it's not appropriate, but in the vast majority of cases conciliation will be first up. Uh, the application fee is $73.90. If conciliation doesn't get you the agreement uh, and you need to move forward, then it's the same application fee for departmental adjudication thereafter. Departmental adjudication is done strictly on the papers. So it's all about the information and the evidence brought forward by the parties. So we don't conduct a hearing. Uh, we don't do site, our adjudicators don't do site inspections. Uh, they rely on submissions provided by the parties and then replies to submissions in that process. Um, it's probably best, I think, in some cases, to think of adjudication as the last resort. Everything else in the process is meant to try and get a result for a dispute. Whether it be conciliation or whether it be the legislative requirement that as an individual you have attempted to resolve this matter yourself. That might sound really obvious, but I can tell you that the number of disputes that I see where there has been no attempt to try and resolve the dispute. Um, we have a section of the form that says, what effort have you made to resolve the dispute? And the applicant will say, oh, I can't possibly talk to them. They won't listen to me. They're impossible to talk to. Not good enough, I'm afraid. That will typically get rejected by me. But, Generally, when you're buying a property, um, prior to signing a contract, you can't get access to um, the body corporate records, so therefore you can't get access to the bylaws. So how can you actually access the bylaws to see uh, if it does allow pets or not, or what the conditions are for, for pets, prior to signing a contract on a, on a property? Well, well uh, through the conveyancing process, again, ideally, depending upon whether or not you've got a search agent, and depending upon what searches that search agent will do, they should be doing a search uh, and hopefully coming up with that kind of information. Again, I take the point that that doesn't necessarily happen in every case. Um, I, I know that it does in a lot of cases. Uh, the real estate agent, hopefully, ideally, fingers crossed, would have some knowledge of the bylaws for that particular scheme, but I take your point, not necessarily in every case. As an occupier, a tenant, I understand the residential tenancies legislation requires that the bylaws be provided uh, as part of the tenancy agreement. Uh, this is where I fess up and say, I'm a tenant in a scheme, I'm an occupier. Uh, I certainly didn't see the bylaws when I moved into my scheme. Uh, my on-site manager now knows where I work, so that's, that's okay. Um, we, we get along really well, so that, that's all okay. Um, but look, I take your point. If there isn't some kind of transparent, open process, pre-purchase, that's where the difficulties arise. In an ideal world, everyone would know what they're up for, not just about bylaws and pets, but the more general issue about, well, you're about to buy into this scheme, upon you taking ownership, you will automatically become a member of the body corporate. Just simple, basic information like that would be great for people to get across. Um, 
You may again think that that's really obvious and really stupid, but I can tell you, on an almost daily basis, people contact my office and say, you know what, I don't know if I'm going to be part of this body corporate anymore. Can I get myself out of it? Can I go it alone? Can I just excuse myself from the body corporate? I'm afraid you can't. Um, and, and people are genuinely surprised by that answer. So that tells me that that difference, I spoke about it earlier in the presentation, that difference between living in a freehold kind of existence and living in the community title scheme, the differences are vast and significant. It would be great if there was uh, some automatic trigger that everybody knew about those differences. There used to be a Form 14 information sheet uh, that was done away with, that requirement, better or for worse. I'm not going to comment whether that was better or worse. Um, in an ideal world, people would come to my office and say, you know what, I'm about to buy a unit, what do I need to be aware of? What's different about it? What, what would help me? Um, sometimes that happens, but not very often. Not very often. So it's tricky. Uh, I've actually uh, done a bit of work with the Real Estate Institute of Queensland uh, doing seminars just like this with their sales and their leasing agents to try and explain some of those differences because it's, it's quite apparent that some agents have no concept of the differences of, of what's involved in either renting or purchasing in a body corporate. That's a very long process and obviously uh, it's going to be tricky for my office to reach every real estate agent in the state. But it's a process that we are undertaking. Yep. Hello. Um, who's got the right to bring an alleged breach of the bylaws? Can tenants actually do that direct to the committee or does it have to come from the owner? Uh, no, tenants can. Uh, so the Probably a point I didn't mention in the slides earlier, that bylaws are applicable to owners and occupiers equally. And indeed, the legislation makes the point that the bylaw cannot discriminate uh, between different classes of people. So you can't have, for example, a bylaw that, uh, and I think it actually says this in the legislation as an example, you can't have a bylaw that says owners are allowed to use the pool, but tenants are not. Uh, that's, that's just not on. So occupiers, under the, and that's the term used under the legislation, tenants certainly do have some rights in relation to bylaw. Equally, they have some obligations under the bylaw in terms of their conduct. Yeah. Hi. Just going back to the vexed uh, pet question. Yes. Um, so we have an owner who has moved into the uh, complex um, I would say in, in, the, in the situation of most people didn't obtain a copy of the bylaws. Uh, she actually has two dogs. Um, the bylaw that we have states that there must be one animal. Um, the previous committee um, did, did start investigating the, the situation and, but it didn't go any further, the, the owner of the dogs has got a, a monitor on, on them to monitor barking. Yep. And there's been no complaint from neighbours on either side um, uh, regarding the animal, but the presence of the two animals, is that grounds for a, for a uh, contravention? So, just for anyone who didn't quite pick all that up, the question there was about the pet by law. The by law apparently says that only one animal per lot. Is that, that right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, in, in that case, I, I would come back to the point again um, that's the by law that's in place. My office would get involved at the end of the process and if it's say got to adjudication, an adjudicator would be asked to consider the validity of that bylaw. Now that, that's all well and good. It comes down to the point, well on what basis was the edict about only one animal per lot made? What are the grounds for doing that? It's very difficult, I think, to be able to put forward grounds. I, I mean, the committee might say, well, you know, if we had more than one per lot, then we'd be overrun with animals and it would decrease property values or whatever the case may be. All of that has some merit in some way, but at the end of the day, you think about it this way. If you're living in a house, there's no law that says you can only have one pet in that house. Yes. 
So why should there be a law that says you can only have one pet in the lot? I'm talking about this very generally, of course, but ultimately I would anticipate that's how it would go, unless there's some very specific reasonable reason why there should only be one animal on the lot, it's quite possible that that bylaw would be found to be invalid. And, yeah. So it's all open to interpretation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. always about the merits of each specific situation, case by case. So Should we get the owner, being the new committee, should we get her the, the, the owner to write a letter requesting permission just to cover... Well, the, as I understand at the moment, she is in contravention of the bylaw she is. as it stands. Now, whether or not that bylaw is eventually going to be found to be invalid is another matter, but as it currently stands, based upon what you're telling me, that owner is not complying with the bylaw. So again, the process of our bylaw enforcement kicks in. First step is to approach, look, the bylaw actually says you're only meant to have one animal in the lot, you've got two. What's your response to that? And I'm certain she will say, well, I want to, so therefore I'm keeping them. Um, then it's up to the committee about what they do about it from that point. Are you going to follow that through and say, well, actually, you're going to have to think about removing one of them. I don't know how she would choose which one to get rid of. But these are the things that, as a committee, you've actually got to put yourself in those shoes and think about that because that's a practicality of the process. Yeah, one's on the way out anyway, so maybe... <laughs> sorry, sorry, just missed that bit. Is there also an argument that the committee can't make that decision because the there is that argument, absolutely, and uh, as I say, it, it, I'm, I'm sort of focusing on the end of the process because I, I know how things will go if it comes to an adjudicator or how it's likely to pan out. So quite possibly, and that argument could possibly be put forward in that process as well. Yeah, I think, do I have time for one more question, Ashley? Uh, one quick one. Oh, sorry, yep. That's mine is very quick. I've subscribed to Common Ground for about 10 years yep. now. Does it still come out as regularly as it used to? Um, not lately, it hasn't, that's right. Uh, I am keen to get that <coughs> restarted and rehappening. Yep. So, fair point. I think there was one more. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was just curious to what your office, what the maximum penalties you do you can hand out are to if you've had uh, a lot of that you've gone through two contraventions with or three contraventions, what can then happen to them? Just very quickly then, distinct, the question was about maximum penalties my office can uh, provide. Uh, an adjudicator has a, a set of orders that it can make under the legislation. An adjudicator can make a cost order up to a pretty limited amount, I think it's $2,000, which is not, not very much when you think about it. There are penalties under the legislation for non-compliance with an order, and I think the penalty there is up to an equivalent amount of $40,000. The point to remember is that my office does not enforce that, does not pursue breaches, doesn't do prosecution. Individuals can actually pursue that themselves through the courts, but it's not like, say, oh, fair trading is a good example, fair trading has an inspectorate with officers uh, and can be enforced that way. My office does not do that. Yeah.